Well, we have reached the end of our course on the Holy Spirit, and I hope it's been helpful to you. We're going to talk a little bit uh, tonight, a little bit more about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, and then I want to just kind of step back and look over the last, I think it's been almost 30 classes, and um, just kind of talk about what we want to take away from this course. Last week, we uh, did sort of a whirlwind tour through a lot of the Old Testament to see the Holy Spirit and that He was always there. He was always working. He was in the Old Testament Scriptures, all over the Old Testament Scriptures. We saw that the Holy Spirit uh, was involved in creation. The second verse of the Bible, there's the Spirit hovering over the waters. Uh, we saw the Spirit and His influence in kings and judges. We saw His influence, of course, in the Old Testament prophets. And uh, tonight I want to look at a promise in the Old Testament about renewal, renewal of the soul and heart that can come through the Holy Spirit that was promised uh, even in Old Testament times. So turn your Bible over to Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel 36. This is a, a beautiful passage, uh, powerful. Ezekiel 36 and 37. It's written to the nation of Israel. Uh, those who were in exile and the people of God they had profaned the name of God they had not been living as they should and, and of course God allowed them to go into exile in Babylon Look at verse uh, 16 of Ezekiel 36, just to kind of get the, the setting of this chapter. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel was living in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Their way before me was like the uncleanness of a woman in her impurity. Therefore I poured out my wrath on them. For the blood which they had shed on the land, because they had defiled it with their idols. The, the, the children of God, they had defiled the whole land with their idol worship. They, they had uh, defiled the land by their evil ways and their evil deeds. And so God says in verse 19, um, Also I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed throughout the lands according to their ways and their deeds, which I, I, I judged them. When they came to the nations where they went, they profaned my holy name because it was said of them, these are the people of the Lord, yet they have come out of his land. Even as they go into captivity amongst the nations, they're profaning the name of God as they go into captivity. And the people of the nations are looking at them and saying, these are the people of God, and, and, and they're profaning, profaning the land. But he says in verse 21, But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations where they went. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. God is about to act. God is about to bless Israel again, but he says it's not because of you and your goodness. It's not because of what you have done. It's because of who I am that I'm going to do this. Uh, I will, verse 23, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. The nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. 
God is promising, I'm going to bring you back out of captivity. And we know that God did that. We can read about it in the Scripture. I'll bring you back to your own land, and I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. Now look at verse 26. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Now according to verses 26 and 27, what is God going to do for the nation of Israel? A new heart. Yeah. I'm going to give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. He says, I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. What, how would you describe a heart of stone? Stubborn. Yeah, that's a word that came to my mind. Stubborn. How else would you describe a heart of stone? Hardened. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. We've, we've seen hardened hearts, haven't we, in, in people that we know, perhaps. Dan. Dead, yeah. Dead. It's uh, just unresponsive to the things of God. Unresponsive, unrepentant, unreceptive to the Word of God. Just a heart of stone, a heart as a rock. And what is God saying that He will do for them? I'm going to take your heart of stone and replace it with what? heart of flesh. Well, how would you describe that? What are we getting at there? Receptive. Yeah, receptive to God. Moldable. Yeah, moldable, yeah. Uh, people who will humbly listen to God. They, they have a soft heart. It's a heart, uh, a good soil in the heart, you might say, borrowing from Jesus' parable, heart that responds, that's receptive, that's open to the, to the Word of God. And notice in the next verse, 27, I will put my spirit within you. Isn't that amazing to see that in the Old Testament? I'll put my spirit within you. That's everything we've been talking about in the New Covenant. And here we see it in the Old Covenant to the nation of Israel. I'm going to put my spirit within you. And, and when God puts his spirit within them, what is that going uh, to do in verse 27? What's going to be the result? Change of attitude, right? What does he say there? Be You'll be obedient, yeah. You'll walk in my statutes. You'll be careful to observe my ordinances. And so where, where does obedience come from? Where is it supposed to come from? From a changed heart, a changed spirit. The inner man has to be changed and transformed. And then from that flows obedience. And that's, again, everything we've been talking about in the, in the class. That God can bring transformation in our hearts, in our minds. He can change the way that we think. He can soften us. And because of that, then, the good deeds and the good works, the obedience should flow out of our lives. But he's, he's going to do this for the nation of Israel, who are so undeserving of this. And so are we. So are we. We stress, and it, it's right to stress, if this is good, I'm not saying it's not good, but we stress a lot the, let's say, the outward obedience to God's statutes and ordinances. And isn't it important that we're obedient to God? 
but what we start to see here is that where does that obedience come from? Uh, it's not so much a, a stress on the rules and regulations, because if it's just an outward obedience to rules and regulations, we're going to fall very short of that, aren't we? But what does it take? The spirit of man must be involved. The heart of man must be involved. There must be a change inwardly, and that's what affects the change outwardly. The Pharisees, for example, they had cleaned the outside of the cup and dish, right? But what was going on inside? Lawlessness. It was full of dead man's bones. Chadrick. I was just thinking as you said that, that's why it's the fruit of the Spirit. You know, yeah. it's, not, it's not my fruit, it's not your fruit, it's the fruit of the Spirit. Yeah, great so. point. It flows out of the Spirit of God and, and us yielding and, and following His Spirit. So there's a promise of renewal through the Spirit of God. This, but, but God must be the one that does this. I, I can't change your heart. Uh, this is really a supernatural work of God, isn't it? That he would grant this transformation, this change of heart and mind. Jim. Yeah, I find it interesting in this particular part of the Old Testament, it's almost the blueprint for repentance and baptism in the New Testament. Right. You know, a repentance is more than saying, I'm sorry, that you change your life, and then you get baptized to receive the Holy Spirit, which helps you do that. Right. So it's interesting in two places we can see the, the pattern there. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Yeah. It, it's, uh, it's been God's plan that he would transform through his spirit. And we, we see it a lot more clearly, I think, on this side of the cross, uh, what God intended. Will cause you to obey. Yeah. I think the NIV says it will move you to obey. And I like move better because that means it's, you're putting your heart and your spirit into. Yeah. You're moving. I like that too. He'll, he'll, he'll move you to obey. It's not like a robotic causing, but a a change of heart and spirit that motivates it. That's good. Well, as we read on, um, for time's sake, come down to verse uh, to chapter 37. Um, this is a, an amazing chapter. A lot we can learn here. 37 verse 1, the hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. Here again, you see the Spirit of the Lord at work in a prophet of God. The Spirit of the Lord brought him out into this valley. I understand this as a vision. I think that maybe that's fair to say this is a vision that the Spirit of God had given to Ezekiel. And what does he see? A valley full of bones, human bones, not a great sight to look at, is it? Verse 2, He caused me to pass among them round about, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and lo, they were very dry. What do we conclude about bones being very dry? Been there a while, yeah. Picked clean, and, and they've been dead a long time. Very dry. He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? Isn't that a good question? <laughs> I like his answer a lot, a lot better uh, than the answer I might have given. Can these bones live? Well, it looks hopeless, doesn't it? They're very dry. They've been there forever. These people have been dead forever, seemingly. Can these bones live? And what's his answer? I don't know. Basically, it's I don't know, but you know, Lord. You know. Ezekiel is wise enough to know that God can do what God pleases. He says, you know. I wish we had that kind of attitude in ourselves more often. I don't always know, but God knows. Verse 4. Again, he said to me, prophesy over these bones. And say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. 
It's an interesting use of the, the verb prophesy over these bones. Uh, he's speaking the word of God to them. He's prophesying to them. Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. What's the only way that dry bones can live again? It starts by hearing the Word of God, doesn't it? You've got to hear the Word of the Lord. Only the Word of the Lord can bring life. And we're going to see in a moment there's another necessary ingredient to life. But it goes right along with the Word of the Lord. Hear the Word of the Lord. How will anyone live spiritually? They have to hear the word of the Lord. And notice that, again, I like to remind us, it's not the speaker's eloquence or knowledge or argumentation skills or logic, but it's the word of God that can cause life in people. So he's speaking the word of God to these bones. Look at verse 5. What is the message? Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. I will put sinews on you, make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you that you may come alive, and you will know that I am the Lord. The Lord's going to bring these bones back to life. He's going to put breath in them. Verse 7, So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. Well, that'd be a sight, wouldn't it? All this whole valley full of bones, the rattling, how that must sound. And they're all coming together, very dry still, coming together, clicking and clacking together. And uh, (laughs) there you go. There you go. Uh, So, I mean, what a a magnificent sight. And then in verse 8, I looked and behold, sinews were on them. And flesh grew and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. So now it seems we have bodies that, I, I picture it as they look, they look alive, but they're not breathing. There's no life in them. What is it that's going to cause life? There you go. There's got to be the breath of God that comes into them. And that's what he had said uh, earlier. I'm, I'm going to breathe into you that you may come alive. Uh, Ezekiel's prophesying, this, this is interesting to me. I don't know how much to push this, but Ezekiel's prophesying alone couldn't really bring them fully back to life. Ezekiel's preaching didn't fully bring them back to life unless there's another ingredient that is involved. And I don't know, I just thought about how we can teach people, we can preach to people, we can preach the word of the Lord to people, but unless they let the breath of God into them, there's not going to be any full life. So look what happens next. Verse 9. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. What was required? The breath of God. The Spirit of God, yes. We know that Spirit is the word wind or breath. The Spirit. Say again. What a sight to see, see. yes. It's the Hebrew word ruach, breath or wind or Spirit. And I think we're to understand this as the Spirit of God comes into these lifeless bodies and gives them life again. Because only the Spirit of God can give life physical or spiritual. And I think here we're talking about, because we talked about all the sins of Israel and everything, their idol worship, how they defiled the name of God, and now God says, I'm going to make you alive again spiritually as a nation. 
So here's this, they're alive, they're an exceedingly great army. And he said to me, verse 11, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We're completely cut off. There was no hope in their mind. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of the graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you will come to life, and I will place, place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. The Lord is going to bring them back out of Babylon. He's going to bring them back to their own land. They're going to be alive again. But it's hard not to read this and, and not think about how we've been brought to life through the Spirit of God, the breath of God, knowing all the passages we saw in the New Testament over the last months. There's, there's not going to be life in us unless the Spirit of God is in us. And I hope that's one of the lessons that we've taken away from all of this study. Life only comes through the Spirit of God. Bob? I've noticed in my life what really brought me to God. You know, I always, had, I always said, I'm sorry, Lord, I did this and that. But you know, really, I look back before I, become a, before I started following Christ, and I'd pray this and that. But I had to have, finally, I had to have godly sorrow. Yeah. I, I, mean, I had more worldly sorrow than ever before in my past. Right. But now, and I, I, Second Corinthians chapter seven, verse nine and ten says, "Yet now I am happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and all, and so you were harmed. You were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Right. There's that soft heart, right? That I'm moldable. I'm willing to repent, I'm willing to change. And uh, yeah, if, there's, if, there, if the Spirit of God is not in us, if we're not allowing Him into our lives, if we're pushing Him away, if we're not yielding to Him, there's no life in us either, spiritually. Only when the Spirit of God got involved did they come to life. Before, they just had a, an appearance of life, and I think that's how... Sometimes we can be, if we're not careful, just an appearance of being alive, but not really alive until the Spirit of God gets involved. Beth. It makes me think of when we're baptized. Yes. We go under the water, and we have no breath when we're under the water. But when we rise up, that first breath is the breath of God. Mm, that's right. And the Spirit is coming in us. That's right breathes into us, makes us a living being again. It's a beautiful thought, isn't it? Other comments or questions? Life only comes from the Lord. Only He can bring the dead to life, and He has in us brought us to life. So yes, I think this this looks forward to the time of Christ and the church. There's too many, there's too many uh, similarities, I think. Well, um, there's a lot more we could say. In the Old Testament about the Spirit, there's more we could have covered in the New Testament. But I hope this has given you a, a nice overview about the Spirit of God. And here it, it took us, I, I lost count, I think 29 or 30 weeks. There's a lot the Bible says about the Spirit of God. And what a tragedy it is that in the church, at times he has been neglected and relegated to the background because there's no life without the Spirit. 
And hopefully we're not afraid to talk about the Spirit, to study the Spirit, to be thankful for the Spirit. And so let's take just a few minutes before we close tonight to talk about some really important takeaways from our study. I kind of want to just wrap it all up and and, uh, tie it up nicely, the best I can. What are some of the most important things we have learned? I'll tell you some that I, that I think are really important, and I hope you'll think of some as well. First, the Spirit truly does dwell in us in a supernatural way. There are many who would try to deny that. Many who would say, yeah, He doesn't really dwell in us. Uh, many who would have to conclude, if they're pressed, the Spirit of God is not doing anything today. And isn't that a tragedy? Don't we miss out on so much if we don't really understand that He does dwell in our hearts, as we've said, individually and collectively as the body of Christ? And, and I've really tried to hammer on a, a theory that is out there that you might hear that that says that the Spirit dwells in us through the Word only. And I have trouble with that, as we've discussed, because really that the logical conclusion of that is that everything is up to us and our own power and our own ability. And if that's the case, aren't we in trouble? If there's no help for us, aren't we in trouble? It leaves everything up to our own strength. It implies that the Spirit is doing nothing today. And nothing could be farther from the truth. He's still very active, if we'll allow Him to be. And the fact that the Spirit dwells within us should be a great incentive to holiness in our lives. To realize, I am a temple of the Holy Spirit, and we are a temple of the Holy Spirit, a dwelling place of God a temple of God, shouldn't that push us to want to live lives of holiness and obedience and to say that, or to to not understand that He's really in me, that, that takes all of that incentive away to obey Him. Next, what should be our response to the Spirit? I think that's very important. Our response to these truths And I think you could sum it up by saying, yield to Him. Walk by the Spirit. And if we will yield to the Spirit and walk by the Spirit, and and that doesn't come through dreams and visions and the Lord told me this and the Lord told me that. Be in the Word of God because the Spirit gave us the Word of God. But it's more than just reading, it's yielding and, and having the Spirit help us to understand and enlighten us, and empower us to live a godly life. And if we'll do that, yield to the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, what will we find? Well, first of all, how do you walk by the Spirit? Set your mind on the things of the Spirit. And you put to death the deeds of the body by the power of the Spirit. That's Romans chapter 8. Spent a lot of time there. But as we do that, what do we find? You set your mind on the things of the Spirit and walk by Him, you find, yeah, you're a Christian in the, in the true sense, right? You're really alive. Uh, very real things happen to us. We find uh, strength to live a holy life. You're not on your own. You're not doing this alone. You'll find strength from God, power for your life. As we walk by the Spirit, we'll find Strength in our trials and tribulations that come upon us. And what is the Spirit of God doing for us as we face those trials? He's interceding for us with groanings too deep for words. And God hears those groanings from our heart, from where His Spirit dwells. As we walk by the Spirit, He changes our hearts, as we just saw tonight. He changes our desires. He he, uh, causes us to want to live for God. It's 
not just outer conformity to the rules and regulations. It's I want to live for God. He transforms us into the image of Christ. 2 Corinthians 3, one of my favorite passages. Chadrick, I know, I know that's one of yours too. You've mentioned it before. He will transform us uh, from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. He'll bring peace into our lives. He'll bring joy into our lives. He'll, uh, I love Romans 5.5. 5. He'll pour the love of God into our hearts. That happens through the Spirit. He'll empower our lives. He'll empower our mission as a church. He'll bring unity to the church. We asked the question, remember, first class, why, why in so many areas is the church dying? Why are we not reaching people with the gospel? Why, why do we seem so complacent and lifeless at times? Well, maybe if we push the Spirit into the background and, and neglected and ignored Him, what else would we expect to happen? We've cut off the whole source of power coming into us if we do that. So He brings unity. He'll bring conviction to the lost. So there's incredible help for us through the Spirit of God. But let me open it up to you. What would you uh, add? What what have you uh, been reminded of? What have you been struck by in the class? Bob? You know, the Holy Spirit, I do believe, I think uh, Jesus says in John seventeen seventeen, they are not of the world, as I am not of the world. Right. Sanctify them by the truth, and your word is the truth. The Holy Spirit don't want us to be like the rest of the world. Why do some church, some churches are looking like the world, it sounds like the world sometimes when they talk right. to them. But like Jesus says, they are not of the world, as I am not of the world. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit is trying to sanctify us from right. being like the rest of the world. Yeah, you reminded me of, uh, in Galatians 5, he says, the Spirit sets its desire against the flesh so that you may not do the things that you please. So he's trying to bring us into holiness and to stop, like you said, stop looking like the world. Chadrick. Right to that scripture. Um, you know, it says... Walk by the Spirit, and you'll not carry out the desires of the flesh, for the flesh sets its desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, so that you may not do the things that you please, right? It's in, it's conflict. Right. So there is conflict, right? And so then it's who are we going to yield to? Are we going to yield to the Spirit, or are we going to yield to our flesh? That's right. Who are we going to yield to? Who are we going to walk by? And that's a powerful thing, isn't it? Walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh uh, because the Spirit is there to fight those, those desires. And there is that war within us, and we're going to lose the, the war unless the Spirit is within us, helping us. Chet, here comes Bob. It's a teachable spirit. Once you've been baptized, the Spirit comes into you. Now, you should, and probably will, and most people do, then have a teachable spirit. And all these things you've gone through all these weeks, you know, do we listen and do we have a teachable spirit? I believe if you are in Christ, you will have that teachable spirit. Yeah, good thought. A humble, moldable teachable spirit. Charles. Uh, one of the scriptures you shared in class that struck me as I never read it before was, uh, if we who are evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will the Heavenly Father know to give good gifts to us? But I've always misquoted that. Hmm. How much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Yeah. So the Holy Spirit is something that we can pray for and ask for. And then all the gifts that we've talked about are things we can pray and ask for. Yeah. That, that's an amazing passage there. But yeah. All these good things, they come from the Spirit. We should be asking God to fill us with the Spirit even though we've already been, we've received his spirit, but can't we go on to new heights 
through the Spirit. Dennis. I like that word renewal up there. <clears throat> and we have it in the New Testament also. That the Holy Spirit is there and he keeps on renewing us. Right. We, we, we get to old and right. he renews us. Yeah. And he keeps on renewing. I'm thinking of Romans 12. Verses 1 and 2, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Renewal. Renewal of the mind only comes through the Spirit of God. Yeah, it's a beautiful thought. Hopefully this will... Um, spur us on to recommitting ourselves to walking by the Spirit because we have everything to gain and it's a, a journey that we can continue to go deeper and deeper into and hopefully we'll ask the Lord to fill us with His Spirit, to bless us with His Spirit. He already has, I know that, but to continue in the Spirit is so important. So I hope you'll do that. I think we can put a bow on it and uh, yeah, yeah, Holy Spirit, live in me. That's what we want. So next week, where are we going from here? Um, we're going to start a study on the minor prophets. <clears throat> so uh, starting with uh, in our, in your Bible, starting with Hosea. Ezekiel, Daniel, and then you start the minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, all the way until Malachi. And uh, the first one we're going to start with is Amos. So if you want to be reading ahead, we're not going to take them in the order they come in our Bibles, but more of a, we're going to shoot for a kind of a chronological order, which they're roughly in that already. There's a lot of debate about how exactly do you order these uh, chronologically. But uh, Amos would be a good, good one to start with. It's an early, one of the early prophets. So read ahead. Read through Amos, and we're not, gonna, we're not going to um, do a deep dive into the minor prophets. Um, that would be very beneficial, no doubt. But I just want to give us uh, an overview of what they're about, what's in these books, what are the major themes that we can learn. We're going to try to look at uh, how are the minor prophets used in the New Testament. They're quoted often in the New Testament. And there's so much we can learn about the holiness of God, God's hatred for sin. Uh, we have a lot of messages of hope, too, but they're very hot books, if I could put it that way. They're very heavy. They're very full of God's wrath, and we need to understand that about God. We need to have a respect for him that we don't, we don't profane his name like we read tonight. We need to have a respect for the holiness of God. So uh, I know this will be helpful for us because it's the word of God. So yeah. we'll start that next week. Amos, be reading in Amos, and we'll uh, talk about that next time. Bob. Yeah, real quick, Dennis, when Dennis made his last comment, he made, made me think about a scripture, and I just got to share it real quick. Sure. In Psalm, Psalms 92, verse 12 through uh, 14, or 15, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will, stare, they will still bear fruit in old age. I they like will that. stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no wickedness in him. Very good. Bearing fruit, even in old age. Continual renewal. I like it. It's a good way to end it.